January 16th, 09, turning geography on its head. There's a story of an elderly Palestinian who leaves his house in search of his next meal during one of our rare morning ceasefires. But he is then unable to find his way back home. Shelling and bombing has radically changed Gaza's cityscape, warping its social structure with it as well. Hundreds of families are forced to flee to different destinations all over the whole of the Strip, and hundreds who used to live alongside one another before are now no longer even in touch. In order to reach the Tel Al Hawa neighborhood in southeastern Gaza City, you have to walk across a lunar landscape. Leaving behind a trail of craters and mounds of rubble, the Israeli tanks yesterday have pulled away after a 48-hour siege. Ever present in this desolate scenario is the lingering, pestilent, and unmistakable stench of death. Struggling past what remains of entire buildings and houses, carcasses of burnt-out cars and ambulances, I started searching for Ahmed's house. It wasn't an easy task because of the radical transformation that whole neighborhoods raised to the ground and burnt to cinders had endured at the hands of the Israeli military. I remembered that Ahmed lived at the end of a dirt road, impossible to recognize now that I was struggling to tread over one whole vast surface of debris that had been chewed and spat out by the tanks. If a satellite photo of Gaza were taken at the end of this massive genocidal attack, it would be difficult to convince anyone that the city in this photo was the same one pictured just 20 days earlier. I had a chance to put my arms around Ahmed again. It was as if we hadn't seen one another in years, after a long journey from somewhere far off. Unfortunately, our journey at the end of the night had no new dawn in sight, except the one set alight by the hatred of those ordering the generals and troops into action for this massacre. My friend showed me where an Israeli tank had stood for two days, right in front of his garden. During all that time, his entire family had remained huddled underneath a stairwell, terrified that a shell shot by a howitzer might wipe them out at any minute. Only last night, Ahmed went against the orders of his apprehensive father and dragging himself across the floor, dared to look out the window at the hellish scenario all around. He saw the tank moving about 30 meters away, smashing into the shutters of a supermarket and opening a hole into it. He then watched the soldiers emerge from the armored vehicle who cheerfully wandered in to, quote, do some shopping. They filled the tank to the point that they were struggling to get back in. He then described the jubilant laughs, the mocking songs providing a soundtrack to the explosions all night long. Quote, Ali, Muhammad, this is a message to your Allah Akbar. The resistance, which for some days had stoically succeeded in limiting the advance of the Israeli tanks, fizzled out within a couple of hours. Kalishnikovs can only tickle plated that tank armor, while the shells of howitzers can blow up a house from wall to wall. The residential neighborhood of Abraj Towers, mainly inhabited by the families of the teaching staff from Al-Aqsa University, and in large part sympathetic with Fatah, certainly does not host any Hamas terrorists. The same way that I'm aware of this, I'm certain that it's all common knowledge in Tel Aviv. It didn't seem to matter though, as the neighborhood was reduced to a pile of rubble all the same. Next to the crumbled building stand the Al-Quds Hospital, set on fire only yesterday. My ISM companions have assisted the hospital staff in evacuating the 300 wounded. There to Gaza City other hospital, Al-Shifa. It took them many hours, especially as moving seriously injured patients required the use of specialist ambulances that the Palestinians don't have. We waited for the last evacuees with Dr. Dakfin Jorkelid from the Norwegian NGO Norwak and asked some questions of the nurses who'd survived the Al-Quds fire. These were blood-curdling stories backed up by my companions, own eyewitness accounts. 
Around 200 meters from the hospital lay about 30 bodies, among them women and children, many of whom were still alive. They couldn't be rescued, as the snipers on the roofs shot at anything that moved. Those bleeding bodies in the streets were civilians who'd escaped from the homes when they'd caught fire after being shelled. The Israeli snipers hadn't hesitated to shoot them one by one, including the children, once they were framed by the viewfinders on their guns. I'll confess that my motto, stay human, has been direly tested in the last few days, but has survived intact nevertheless. It pulled through just as the pride for and, and attachment to one's native land expressed as identity and the right to self-rule has enabled Gaza's people to carry on. From the university professors to the people you meet in the street, doctors and nurses, reporters, fishermen, farmers, men, women and teenagers, those who've lost everything and those who had nothing to lose all will use their last breath to say insha'Allah for the sake of the sincere conviction that their roots run so deep that no enemy bulldozer can tear them out. As I write, a TV screen not far off is showing images from the inside of the Al-Shifa hospital. Men in tears cover their faces as if to contain a flood of desperation. At Shujia, east of Gaza City, a shot from a tank just killed seven and wounded 25. The casualties were all at a funeral commemorating a family member who'd been killed the previous day. Yesterday, the Israeli Defense Minister Eid Barak apologized to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon for the artillery fire against the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees in Gaza City, which had been built with the Italian government's money. Berlaskuni, where are you? It was a grave error, Barak said. There wasn't a trace of an apology to the families of the 357 Palestinian children killed up till now. Clearly, that was no error. I listened to a Red Cross paramedic tell me the story of their arrival on the scene of a massacre at Zaytun. A visibly malnourished child crouched in front of his mother's corpse already in an advanced state of decay. He had taken care of that body for four days, as if she were still alive. He had dried the blood from her face and dragging himself through the rubble of what had been their home, bringing her water, bread, tomatoes, which he'd carefully placed next to her head. He thought she was only sleeping. The Israeli snipers had prevented the Red Cross from rushing in to bring aid, and they only managed to reach the scene of the massacre several days later. Stay human.